Welcome back to part two of our uh, discussion of the state of American democracy and the rise of corporate capitalism, uh, inverted totalitarianism with uh, Professor Sheldon Woolen, who taught politics for many years at Berkeley uh, and later Princeton. Uh, he is the author of several seminal works on political philosophy, including Politics and Vision uh, and Democracy Incorporated. Professor Woolen, um, we were talking about uh, the freeing of corporate capital because of the Cold War uh, from internal democratic restraints. Uh, and that freeing saw corporate capital really make war against participatory democracy, democratic institutions. Can you describe a little bit what the process was, how they began to hollow out those institutions and weaken them? Well, I think you really have to start with the uh, political parties themselves. The Republicans, of course, have never been uh, had much of an appetite for uh, popular participation. The Democrats have had a checkered history of it, sometimes uh, very sympathetic and other times uh, indifferent. But um, the, the, during, the, uh, during the 60s and, uh, and, the, and really even during the 50s as well, uh, movement toward democracy began to take shape with the realization of the uh, of the kind of voter restrictions, the most elementary kind of res restrictions on democracy, prevalent especially, of course, in the South, and especially involving the disfranchisement of, uh, of, of African American uh, voters. So that the, uh, uh, that kind of uh, that kind of development, and of course the uh, attempt on the part of uh, of uh, freedom riders and others to go into the South and try to uh, to help uh, African Americans politi organize politically and and to def and to defend their their rights, created a kind of political context. I think probably w which had never been had never existed before in which the, uh, there were fundamental arguments about franchise, election, disenfranchisement, race, and uh, a range of related issues that, uh, that simply called for a kind of uh, a debate that, as I say, had, had, had scarcely been raised for, for decades. And it, uh, it meant that uh, a, a certain generation or a couple of generations had had a political exposure that was uh, truly unprecedented in recent American history. Not only the freedom riders who went down, but practically every campus in the country was affected by it. And not only because various faculty and students went to Alabama and elsewhere, but because it became a standard topic of conversation to, f to f f learn how the movement was doing what kind of obstacles were being met and what we could do. And there were marches and marches and marches. So that it was a, uh, it was a political experience that was, I think, uh, as I've said, unprecedented uh, in terms of its intensity and in terms of the huge number of, uh, of, of uh, citizens being involved of a younger, younger age. And yet, when we look back at the 1930s, uh, what I think marked the so-called New Left was that it was not coupled with labor. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. The 30s and the, the 30s were kind of a peculiar thing. I mean, it was a. It had. It was. A, it shouldn't be uh, simply dismissed because it did have lasting influence because it showed, uh, to some degree at least, that that it was possible to get a progressive administration that Roosevelt, whatever his failings and shortcomings, had, had shown that with sufficient popular support, you could manage to make some kind of dent in the, in the, uh, in the kind of political privileges that existed in the country and help to benefit the economic plight of, of most people. And he did make serious attempts. It, uh, it, of course, ran into all kinds of problems, but that, 
That's the nature of politics. But I don't think it can be underestimated the extent to which the, uh, the New Deal uh, influence spread throughout the society. I think it had a, an extraordinary uh, effect, in long-run effect, in terms of igniting ideas about popular participation and its possibilities. And yet it was really a response to the breakdown of capitalism. It certainly was. I mean, it, it, it had its limitations. But I think there's a very real question about how far the country was prepared to go at that time. It's important to remember that the early 30s, meaning by that from 1932, say, on, was not only a period of New Deal ferment, it was also a period of reactionary ferment. And that one mustn't forget such things as the Liberty League and also, and above all, Father Coughlin, right. uh, which, who was a, an extraordinary figure, someone who began as a defender of the New Deal and ended up as a bitter anti-Semite and had to be disowned or at least throttled by his own church. It had become so extreme. But, the, uh, but, but there, there, were, there were a lot of things uh, percolating in those years and on, on both sides, because I've said the, uh, the New Deal and the liberal uh, resurgence uh, also, uh, uh, also would affect, uh, uh, cause its, uh, its, uh, cause a reaction that, uh, that I think led to a kind of permanent, uh, I want to say permanent conservative realization that it had to develop a kind of standing set of its own institutions and foundations and fundraising activities all the year round, not just to wait for elections, but to become a kind of permanent force, in a conscious conservative force in American politics from the ground up. And that started when, would you say? I would say it started with the reaction to the New Deal, which would mean in about 1934. And so essentially they're building anti-democratic institutions to, exactly. to burrow the, their, their, the, themselves into what we would consider the fundamental institutions of an open society, universities, the press, um, political parties. Would that be correct? Yeah, that would, that would be largely correct, yes. They did realize that, the, that those institutions were porous and that they lent themselves to, uh, you know, to the influence of money and the influence of, uh, of, the, of the kind of people who had big, big money. And uh, so they waged a, uh, you know, a counter campaign and, and the result was, <clears throat> I think, a, uh, a sort of permanent change, especially in the Republican Party, because remember, the Republican Party was was not a reactionary party uh, in the early 30s, and even as late as the 1936 election with Al Flandon, who was very much a moderate, and uh, he only won, won Maine and Vermont, but uh, still, uh, it, he was significant. And that uh, Wendell Wilkie was a power in the party until at least 1940. Uh, had a liberal, very important liberal wing. So it took a while for the evolution of the Republican Party to becoming the kind of staunch and continuous uh, opponent of, of New Deal uh, legislation with, with leaders who by and large were committed to rolling it back and to introducing conservative reforms in education, in uh, economic structure, in social security systems, and so on. We had spoken earlier about what you term inverted totalitarianism. When did that process begin? Would we, would we signal the beginning of that process uh, with those reactionary forces in the 1930s? Is that when it started? Um, I think in, a, in the broad view it would uh, start, back, uh, start back then. I think uh, to get it's, that it didn't gain full steam until you had those uh, uh, parallel developments that involved 
such sophisticated public relations uh, powers and uh, political party organizations that uh, were round-the-year operations that uh, with a conscious ideological slant and an appeal to donors who, who wanted to support that kind of slant so that politics, while all of those elements had been present to be sure for a long time, they achieved a certain organizational strength and, and uh, longevity that I think was unique to that period. And one has to remember that, uh, that the 30s was a very troubled political period because not only of the, the New Deal and the controversies it raised, and not only because of the reactionary elements at home, but Europe was clearly uh, heading towards some uncertain future with Hitler and, and Mussolini, and then the specter of Stalin, so that uh, it was a very, very worrisome, nervous period that had a lot to be nervous about. Do you have a theory as to why countries like Germany, uh, Spain, why Europe went one way and America went another? Well, I think, I, I'm sure there are lots of reasons. One that I would emphasize is the failure of governments in that country to be able to capture and mobilize and sustain popular support while introducing structural, economic, and social changes that would meet the, the kinds of growing needs of a, of a large urban and industrialized population. I think that was the failure. You talk in, uh, I think it's in Politics and Vision, about how fascism arose out of Weimar, uh, which was essentially a weak democracy, and yet you argue inverted totalitarianism, certainly a species of totalitarianism, uh, can often be the product of a strong democracy. It can, uh, in the sense that uh, that strong democracy can do what its name implies. In the pursuit of popular ends, it develops inevitably powerful institutions to promote those ends. And very often, they lend themselves to being taken over and utilized. That, uh, that uh, for example, that uh, popular means of communication and uh, and uh, news information and so on uh, can become, you know, very easily propaganda means for, 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 uh, for corporate capitalism, which understands that if you gain control of uh, newspapers, radio, television, that you're in a position to really shape the political atmosphere. You write in Democracy Incorporated that you don't believe we have any authentic democratic institutions left? I don't. That may be a bit, of a bit of an overstatement. But I think in terms of effective democratic institutions, I don't think we do. I think there's potential. I think there's potential uh, in movements towards self-government, movements towards uh, uh, economic independence, and movements towards educational reform and so on, that have the seeds for, for change. But I think that uh, it's very difficult now, given the way uh, the media is controlled and the way political parties are organized and controlled, it's very difficult to get a foothold in, in politics in such a way that you can translate it into electoral reforms, electoral victories, and, and legislation and so on. It's a very, very complex, difficult, demanding process. And as I've said before, democracy's great trouble is it's episodic. Right. And that just uh, makes it easier for those who can hire other people to keep a sustained pressure on government to go the other way. You talk about how uh, democratic institutions, which have essentially surrendered themselves uh, to corporate power have pushed politics, if we define politics as that which is concerned with the common good and with uh, 
accepting the, the risks, the benefits, and the sacrifices evenly across the society, that, uh, that essentially that has pushed political life to some extent underground, um, outside of the traditional uh, political institutions. I, th I think there's, a, I certainly think that there's something to be said for that because um, I think if you look strictly at our political parties and the national poli political processes, uh, you get a picture of a society which seems to be moribund in terms of popular democracy. But if you look at what happens locally, and even in state, uh, statewide uh, situations, there's still a lot of vitality out there, and people still feel that they have a right to complain, to agitate, to promote uh, causes that will benefit them. And this, uh, this still remains, I think, a, a strong element in it. But I do think we're facing a, a period of, in which economic uncertainty is such that, uh, particularly for younger people, in the sense that we don't really know anymore with any degree of high certainty how to prepare young people for a constantly changing economy so that young people, in a certain sense, who are the, the sort of stuff of, uh, of later political movements and, and political uh, support systems, that young people are, in a very real way, uh, puzzled and, I think, confused and sort of don't know where to go and are being propelled in certain directions that, uh, that don't really add up to their long-run uh, benefit. And, it's a, uh, and it, it, it starts with, I think, the uh, secondary education and it continues in college. The, uh, the plight of liberal arts education is just extraordinary today. It's, it's so much on the defensive and uh, so much on the ropes that, that it's hard to see what, 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 if any, place it'll have in the future. It's hard to see you in most politics departments at American universities today. It was probably a lonely position even when oh, you... Oh yeah, because most American, uh, uh, most uh, uh, political science departments have become, in effect, social science departments and much more addicted to seeking uh, uh, quantitative uh, projects that lend themselves to, to apparent scientific certainty and are less attuned, in fact, I think even, I would say, apprehensive about appearing to be supportive of popular causes. It's, uh, it's, it's just not in the, in the grain anymore. And the more that academic positions become precarious, as they have become, with tenure becoming more and more a rarity. 35% now of positions yeah, are actually Yeah, I would tenure. believe it. I would believe it. I mean, and that that becomes the uh, that becomes a problem in terms of finding uh, people willing to take a certain risk, uh, with with the understanding that while they're taking a risk, it won't be so fatal to their life chances. But I'm afraid it is now. Right. And uh, and it doesn't bode well because it seems to me it in a left-handed sort of way it encourages the kind of professionalization of politics that uh, results in the kind of political parties and political system that we've been warned about from the year one. And a political passivity, yeah. which you say, uh, you talk about uh, classical totalitarian regimes mobilize the masses, whereas in inverted totalitarianism, the goal is to render the masses politically passive. And you, you use Hobbes yeah. to describe that. Could you speak a little bit about that? Well, Hobbes is interesting because he's, uh, he writes in the so-called social contract tradition. And that had been a tradition which grew up in the late 16th and 17th century. The social contract position had furthered the notion that a political society and its governance 
were the should be the result of an agreement, of an agreement by the people as to what sort of government they wanted and what sort of role they wanted to, to play for themselves in such a government. So that the, and the social contract was an agreement they made with each other, that they would create such a, a system and that they would support it, but they would reserve the right to oppose it, even rebel against it, if it proceeded to work contrary to the designs of the, of, of the original, uh, original contract. So that uh, that became the sort of uh, 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 medium by which democratic ideas were carried through the 17th century and into much of the 18th century, including the American colonies and the, uh, and the, and the arguments over the American uh, Constitution as well. And, and especially, I should add, among the, in the arguments about state constitutions and government. And um, that fostering of political passivity, uh, you said in, uh, or have said in your work, is caused by what you were speaking about earlier, the economic insecurity, the precariousness of the position, which I think you go back to Hobbes as, as citing as one of the kind of fundamental controlling elements uh, to shut down any real political activity. I think, I, yes, I believe that very strongly. I think the, if you go back way to the uh, Athenian democracy, the, the, one of the things you notice about it is that it paid citizens to participate. In other words, they, they would be relieved from a certain amount of economic insecurity in order to, to engage actively in politics. Well, when we get to our times and modern times, uh, that, that kind of guarantee doesn't exist in any form whatsoever. We barely can manage to, to have an election day uh, that isn't uh, where we suspend work and other obligations to give citizens an, op an opportunity to vote. They have to cram a vote into a busy, normal day. So that the, uh, the relationship between economic uh, structures and institutions and political institutions of democracy are just really in tension now, in which the, uh, uh, which the requirements of the one are being undercut by the operations of the other. And I don't see any easy solution to it because the, uh, the forces that uh, control the economy control to a large extent public opinion, um, modes of, uh, of, uh, of uh, publication and so on, and, uh, and make it very difficult uh, to mount uh, uh, counter, counter views. Well, in fact, to engage in real participatory democracy or political activity is to put yourself in a more precarious position vis-a-vis -vis your work, your status uh, within the society. There's no question about it. And that, that's true of, I think, virtually every activity. It's now certainly frowned upon in academic uh, uh, act work, and it's certainly in uh, pu uh, public education. It's, it's frowned on, and there's no effort made to really make it a bit easier for people to, to participate. And the uh, intensity that economic survival requires today leaves most people exhausted. There's, uh, and one, understandably, they don't, they don't have much, if any, time for, for politics. So we're, we're in a really difficult situation where the requirements of democracy are such that they're being undermined by the realities of a kind of economy and society that we've, that we've developed. Which you point out Hobbes foresaw. He did. He did indeed, and his solution was you surrender, right. you surrender, surrender your political power. rights. Yep. Uh, thank you. Stay tuned for part three with our discussion with uh, Professor Sheldon Wollen.